I'm Lawrence Francis, host of Interpreting Wine, welcoming you to the Sonoma County Winemaker Special Series. Across these four episodes, recorded in January 2023, we'll be exploring the modern Sonoma County scene in the company of four respected producers, giving you the most up-to-date exploration of the region available anywhere in podcast format. Make sure you're subscribed to be alerted when new episodes go live. We kick things off today in the company of David Ramey of Ramey Wine Cellars. We hear David's fascinating wine origin story before he takes us on a virtual tour of their terroir, talks viticulture, and gives us a deep dive into the Wolsey Road vineyard planting, takes us inside their winemaking style, and discusses changes in those styles over the last 30 years. Enjoy. I was first exposed to wine the uh, summer of 71. I, I spent a, that summer in Spain, in Madrid, uh, studying Spanish, and, and wine, was, wine was everywhere, including uh, I, I was put up in the home of a, a dentist in downtown Madrid and, and made pretty wealthy people. Maid had a glass of red wine for me, a juice glass of red wine at breakfast every morning. And I, I finally told her, no, don't. I, I mean, I wasn't. You know. But then, you know, red wine was everywhere. And um, shortly after that, at, at UC Berkeley, I had been at UC Santa Cruz, and you could do an inter-campus visitation. So I spent a quarter at Berkeley, and I ended up staying in the room in the Berkeley Hills of a, the home of a mother of a classmate at Santa Cruz. And she worked for uh, UC, University of California, and um, uh, she used to have dinners, dinner parties with, you know, professors and photographers for National Geographic. And, mm-hmm. and these were like two, three hour dinners. And, and it, I, I realized as, a, as an only child raised by non-communicative parents that, that to have have these soirees, these dinner parties with, you know, six, eight people and they'd last. And what was the glue that created that other than the hospitality of the home? It was wine. Wine mm-hmm. held people together. Wine loosened your tongue and made you feel warm and pleasant. And and I just fell in love with wine. I started visiting wineries. I started reading wine books. And uh, somewhat of a demographic blip, um, a bunch of us in the late seventies ended up in the department of viticulture and enology at UC Davis um, amongst my colleagues, uh, Kathy Corson, Mm -hmm. John Conesgaard, Mm -hmm. David Graves and Dick Ward of Saintsbury, um, Doug Nall, um, Lee Hudson, um, Randall Graham, um, Dan Lee of Morgan, and we all decided to become winemakers. We're all liberal arts retreads <laughs> for the most part. Um, and we decided to make wine. Now, so I got the, the, it took four and a half years from Chem 1A to the Master of Science in Enology. Um, so I have eight and a half years of university. I'm, <laughs> at least I was highly educated at one point. Um, and then I think I was the only one of our class to go to France to work mm. at work a harvest and see, I thought, well, these folks have been working with these varieties for a thousand years or more. Mm-hmm. Let's see how they do it. They must've figured out a thing or two. So I ended up uh, working in Bordeaux in Pomerol with um, the établissement Jean-Pierre Mouex. Um, and um, then I came back. And um, and everybody else at the time, the wine industry in California was so ascendant that everybody got full charge winemaking jobs right out of the gate. So this was the second way I was unique. I was the only one to go to France. And I was the only one that sought out a, an assistant winemaker position because I didn't want to. I knew I didn't know how to make wine, you know. Yeah. And so I, I, I approached Elma Long, who had just left Mandavi to go to see me. And, mm-hmm. and she hired me as, as assistant winemaker. And so for almost five years, we did really good work together with um, uh, oxidized juice and white wine, with Lee's contact and barrel fermentation, 
malolactic. Um, and then I, I did an experiment and published a paper on the effects of skin contact temperature and Chardonnay juice and wine, which, which then uh, kind of at the time, everybody was doing overnight skin contact and extracting all these tannins from the skins. But then those tannins would oxidize in the bottle three, four, five years later. The wines didn't age well. So anyway, that was good work. Then I, then I was asked, after about five years with Selma, I was asked to replace Mary Edwards at Matanzas Creek. So I kind of um, uh, I did that for about five years. And um, then Chris Chamoex asked uh, me back to France. He had an idea that we would work together. And so with my now wife and business partner, wife of 33 years, Carla, uh, we, we went in 89 and worked again in a different capacity in Bordeaux. The first time I was just doing uh, pump overs and shoveling out tanks. The second time I was driving around with Jean-Claude Barraway and, and, and doing some sampling and, and different things. Um, and um, then Chris and I said, well, it's, it's, not, it's not time to work together yet. Find a job and then we'll see. So I took the job at Chalk Hill. So for six years to the day, in the early 90s, 90 to 90, early 96, I, uh, I, I kind of changed Chalk Hill around. And then Christian asked me to um, come over and manage Dominus, and I raised some objections. I said, well, Christian, you, you don't have a winery because they had been custom crushing at Rombauer. He said, no, we're going to build one. You'll be in charge of that, which, which I was. Um, and then I said, but Christian, you, you, you don't make any white wine. He said, well, if you want to make a little Chardonnay aside, that's okay. And, you know, a light bulb went off. It was like, well, okay, I hadn't thought of that, but I know how to do that. So we started in 1996 with um, 260 cases of Hyde Vineyard Chardonnay. I knew Larry Hyde from Matanzas Creek had bought his Semillon to go into the Matanzas Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and then we added Hudson uh, the, uh, Chardonnay, Hudson Vineyard Chardonnay the next year, 97. Um, and then in early 98, I left Dominus to go help Les Rudd turn the Girard Winery into Rudd Estate. And um, so that was my last job, but it enabled me to grow grow the brand. And by the time I left, I was at about 15,000 cases. Mm -hmm. um, we located in Healdsburg, which is where we currently are and, and, and live. Uh, that's the, the, the coolest town in wine country. It's in Sonoma County. Uh, it's not in Napa. Um, and, um, I've always been attracted, more attracted to Sonoma than Napa. And, um, that, that feeling has only grown stronger over the decades as Napa has evolved into a, a glitzy, uh, tourist destination. Um, so yeah, so Carl and I grew the brand without, um, partners or investors. And, uh, we were able to buy our ranch, Westside Farms, 10 years ago, um, 75 acres on West Side Road. Uh, it's a mile south of Rocchioli. It's across the street from William Sellium. Um, 42 acres of grapevine, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. And um, it's in the Russian River. Russian River is relatively cool. Um, not quite as cool as more coastal. Uh, Fort Ross Seaview or the new, the now the west, whatever it is, West Sonoma Coast, Far Sonoma Coast. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, our, our summer days here are marked by morning fog from the Pacific Ocean, and then that burns off. So we wake up at, at um, oh, in centigrade, about uh, 13 or 14 centigrade, and then it gets up to about 30 centigrade uh, by the afternoon. And this is ideal conditions for Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir. Parts of Sonoma County is much larger than Napa and more diverse so there's there the the more northern and easterly portions of Sonoma County, Alexander Valley and Moon Mountain, for example, Sonoma Valley, mm -hmm. farthest away from the ocean, um, are places that they can grow uh, more late ripening varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon and do well. But um, mm -hmm. we sort of I, I've sort of become identified with Chardonnay, and so the cooler areas are more suitable for that. So, and then as you mentioned, uh, Lawrence, uh, we did, uh, Claire and, and Alan, um, 
joined the winery. Um, uh, they, own everything. <laughs> they own everything now. Um, and um, Alan, Alan's 30, Claire's 32. Alan just spent a year in uh, Cambridge and he got a, an accelerated MBA, 12 month continuous program. So he came back this last uh, September from there and we'll be going in um, April, end of April coming up because his graduation, it was normally you'd have two nine month academic years. This was 12 month continuous, but the, the normal members of his class are, are graduating in, in April, end of April. And so we'll go there for the, for the graduation. So we'll be there. Um, we have been, I knew Jasper Morse, um, because I met him with my friend and barrel broker, Mel Knox, uh, in about 1986, actually, at Becky Wasserman and Russell Hone's home in La Bouillon. And um, I, I'm, that's when I met Jasper. And he was starting his import company, Fields Morrison Burden. Mm -hmm. And he came out, you know, he was over and he asked at our house, he had dinner. And, and wanted to import the wine. So I said, sure, thanks. So we started relatively early in the UK market with um, uh, Fields Morris and Verdon. Um, and then he he merged with Berry Brothers or was absorbed into Berry Brothers. So effectively, we've been with um, Fields Morris and Verdon and, and Berry Brothers since, I don't know, early aughts, I think, something like that. Um, so that's that's the story, and we do make a, a private label Chardonnay for Barry Barry Brothers Barry's own uh, Sonoma mm -hmm. County Chardonnay. So that's a, um, a private label thing favor we do for them and, and them for us. And um, I do I do tailor that, even though our Chardonnay is not um, not very high in alcohol. It's typically thirteen point eight, thirteen point nine. Um, I, I target the Berry Brothers a little lower, 13.2. And uh, even though it's it's barrel fermented uh, for 12 months on the leaves, there's no new oak. So I sort of tailor it for the English market. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as always, uh, you know, hearing these condensed origin stories, it, it, there's always so many... Uh, different directions that, that I can sort of, you know, take things in and, and, and different questions that, that I, I can ask. Um, I think the, 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 the part of the story, um, yeah, that you've, that you've really already introduced, David, I think is, is really around location, I would say, and, 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 and site, because, of the, you know, it, it feels as though, you know, more and more now I hear winemakers talking about the wines, you know, expressing that sense of place and, and actually, you know, trying to, to sort of capture, um, yeah, a little bit of um, what it's like to actually be there and, and to kind of be be stood in, in, the, in the vineyard. So, so I would really kind of encourage you to expand on that in two different ways. I think, you know, firstly is site selection, you know, that you made when, when, you, when you actually purchased and uh, maybe taking us a little bit inside, you know, what were some of the, the forces behind that decision um and then also just that visual you know i've i've still yet to have the pleasure uh, of, of visiting sonoma um and you know just kind of show me and to show the listener what does it look like you know what 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 is the what is the landscape showing that that, that we may well see represented in the bottle well i, I often it's said and, I, and from pictures i've seen and my one visit to Italy. I've been to France more times than I can count. Certainly more than three dozen. I, I don't even know. But I've only been to Italy once. Something wrong with that. But um, the Tuscan countryside, um, you know, rolling hills, um, vineyards, uh, little towns, uh, little villages here and there, except for Santa Rosa, which is uh, the largest city between San Francisco and Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So that's where everybody goes pretty much for their lawyers and accountants and, and things like that. But um, yeah, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's, it's generally, I would say very bucolic, very harmonious. It, the, there is pressure, uh, urban, urban sprawl and more, 
a lot of, you know, people retire from their jobs in San Francisco or elsewhere and, and, and buy a nice, you know, house in wine country in the midst of vineyards. And so agriculture, um, which is principally wine grapes in Sonoma County now, um, is under pressure from, from ranchettes, from, from people that, you know, they're not in the business and many, most of them are retired and they don't have kids in the school system. And, and, uh, they, 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 they think there's too many wineries. They retire to wine country and think there's too many wineries. So, uh, agriculture is, is under pressure from ranchettes from, um, yeah, in Sonoma County. But otherwise, it's 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 still it's still primarily agriculture. It's still beautiful. Uh, we got hills on both sides. We got the coastal range on the uh, west, and then the uh, Mycamas Mountains on the east separate Napa from Sonoma. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and again, you know, an insight really, I guess, into um, yeah the 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 size of the property as it stands now, and also I guess a sense of how that has grown over the years if indeed it has when you say the property what are you referring to so i guess your your vineyards oh well so it's 75 acres there's 42 acres in in grapevines which is about 20 hectare mm-hmm. um and um we liked it it was uh, it was planted to chardonnay and pinot noir uh uh-huh. we're now some it was originally planted in 1989 so some of those vines are old and we've pulled out two blocks on block two and block three and are replanting to Chardonnay and a little Pinot Noir on a rise on the rise. It's generally uh, flatter land. There's a little upslope. Um, it does occasionally flood. It did in 17. It did in 19, but it just goes down right away. Um, it, did, it did not flood this. We just had a bunch of rain. It did not flood this year. Um, but the floods are not a problem. They just, they, when, once they recede, you have to go around and pick up the detritus that floated downstream from up river, um, logs and, and things. Sometimes there's some, um, Mm -hmm. trellis damage, but the vines are, the vines are dormant. So they can, they can go three weeks with, with waterlogged, uh, roots before it, it affects them. So it's not an issue. Um, but so there's there's a mixture of, of it's gravelly clay loam, the soil. Um, so it's it's richer than some hillside soils, but not not super rich. Um, so there's and that's that's a key thing in selecting a site is to is to not have. Um, I mean, I, okay, in, in general things. I mean, I don't like serpentine soils because the high magnesium um, is a problem for for the the vines and and that. The red grapes particularly come out very deeply colored, but very acidic and lacking in charm. Mm-hmm. Um, and and if, if you have too rich a soil, like like an Ohio cornfield, um, the the vigor the every soil has what the soil scientists call vigor capacity. And mm-hmm. when you have a lot of vigor capacity, it grows big vines, and and um, that's not good for for wine quality. Too much shading, too much leaf leafy vines make uh, leafy wines um so uh, the the right amount of of sun exposure on the grape clusters is, yeah. a, is a key factor sometimes if the soil is too limiting like like you know the soil tends to be moved downhill over mm-hmm. over millennia mm-hmm. and so sometimes the top of the hill has been scraped and there's just very little topsoil so those Stunty little vines don't always make good wine. The best, the best soil is kind of at the t- what the, the toe of the slope. The um, that's where the good soils come down, but it's not it's not bottom land. That's really good soil, and and I think that's what you find um, in Napa Valley along the 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 two the two uh, ranges, the Vaca Range and the Mayacamas Range. Um, a lot of the really top vineyards are in that toe of the slope area on either side of of the central valley very cool and i'm always curious really david to to know when you when you say that you've you've got a 75 acre ranch and around 
40 or so acres are planted to vine. What's going on in the in the other 30 or so acres? So there's six and a half acres across the road. It, it, it's split by West Side Road. Six and a half acres over there where we have plans to build the winery and then has a house that Claire and her husband, Yvonne, live in. So that's not really plantable. Um, and then, so if you take 75 minus six, you're at 69. And then minus uh, 40, you're at uh, 29. So there's like 29 acres of wild, of, of riparian natural growth. Uh-huh. And it just, you uh-huh. know, you, you couldn't, I mean, it's like, it's mostly uh, along the, the riverside uh, between our vineyard and the river. That's all um, feral. That's that's all wild. That mm-hmm. uh, it will never be developed. Mm-hmm. I think we have to be careful, human beings, about scorched earth development, be it agricultural or or urban. Um, <laughs> we need to, yeah, we we need to leave some nature around. Mm-hmm. It, it, it serves a, a key role in the bigger picture. Absolutely. And, and um, is there a, a connection that can be made, perhaps, but, you know, between, uh, you know, that that land, as you say, and, and, and leaving it wild and leaving it as habitat and, and actually then the impacts that you that you observe on the on the on the on the growing sites? I mean, I, I understand yeah. that there's already influences coming from the Pacific Ocean and, and that there's morning fog coming and settling over the vines. And do, do you see that, that also that those sort of 29 or so acres that are, that are kind of left wild, they also play their part in the, in the micro system and the, the, the micro. Well, I'm, I'm sure there are some good aspects, but the, the, the principal one that comes to mind is a negative, And that is that, um, mm. you know, there, there's, um, there's, um, insects over there that that mm. that then um inject into the vine you know family virus and so you, you get you get viral diseases that are that are a problem from so that it's that's that's the downside uh, sure. but the rest is just ah, you know can't can't pave it all we can't can't plant it all don't want to and and is there a? I mean, presumably, um, you've got strategies for for dealing with those invaders that that that, that want to kind of come in and uh, yeah, yeah. It's a little up. it's a little complex, but um, Pierce's disease is another another um, thing that that uh, happens close to the riparian mm-hmm. uh, growth by the river. Um, there is. Um, there are some grape varieties that um, Andy Walker at UC Davis developed with Native American crosses with Native American varieties. And, and we are going to, at the side right next to the river, we are going to put about six rows of, of one of them, Caminante Blanc. Um, it's it's, it's um, substantially Chardonnay, but not strictly Chardonnay. But in the in the Russian River blend, you know, it just has to be 85 percent so we can we can blend in a little of these pd pierce's disease resistant mm-hmm. um, grape vines or wines ah so so actually almost using them as a as a bit of a barrier really between those yeah. invaders and yeah. the, the more yeah, because they're because they're resistant they don't they don't get pierce's disease so okay very interesting, and uh, is that something that you're currently planting, or that's something that's that's already? It's, it's, I believe it's going to go in. My, my daughter Claire Claire does does the vineyards now, so she's in charge. But it's all staked out that little portion, those six rows or so, and I think they're going to go in the ground this next this 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 year this this spring. Okay, very interesting, and uh, you've I think you know very naturally started talking about viticulture and, and uh, you know, started, uh, you know, talking about, you know, I think some uh, innovations and adaptations to, to the to the site that you've got there. And, and uh, I guess, you know, adaptations that are, that are about harmonizing with the site, you know, and not, and not about sort of bringing in uh, additional inputs or unnecessary inputs into the... Into no, the- yeah, you, you have to deal with, what, with where you are, with what you have. But, you know, you have to adapt adapt a little bit, but, but mostly it's, you know, it's, it's substantially, um, unirrigated, um, mm. 
and and you know we 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 are as organic as we can be. We're not interested in the certification, but you know we eliminated systematic uh, Roundup in the in the vine row. Mm-hmm. The problem with that is um, it it kills it creates a dead zone in the in the in the vine row. The the soil microbes, the the you know fungi and bacteria, they don't have the little rootlets to grow on and so it yeah. becomes barren there and that's not good either uh, everybody i think is a big big buzzword these days is uh, buzz phrases regenerative agriculture and even, even without being biodynamic everybody appreciates the life of the soil the, mm-hmm. the secret life of the soil and the the interplay between the, the rhizomes and and the, and the fungi and the roots of the grapevines and the general health of the soil. Nobody wants a sterile vineyard anymore. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, the, the, this, I think, is, you know, where, where you know, another huge buzzword and, you know, an, a, an important conversation to be had, you know, is, is around sustainability. And I think, I think it's, yeah. it's, it's about all of those inputs, the cost of those inputs, the, you know, finding the people to, to, to be there and to work as well, you know, sustainability kind of, uh, I think it, uh, you know, applies on, on multiple different levels. And, it, and it's, it's not just about the, the, the ecological impact anymore. It's about all, all those other impacts, societal impacts included. One of the things actually, David, that stood out from uh, your questionnaire and the pre-work that I asked you to do was um, talking about planting the Woolsey Road vineyard, which, you know, I gather is, is, is something that you will have had a uh, any, 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 and uh, a key role in, and, and you know, will have been you know part of your uh, history with the with the site. So I wonder if if that's something that you wouldn't mind describing, which which I think will give us an insight into your philosophy and and your experience around the viticulture side of things. Yeah. So we, we, I, I have a, a friend, uh, but um, who's been our vit consultant for over twenty years, Daniel Roberts, Doctor Dirt. He's a PhD in soil scientist and in a, a long history at, at Kendall Jackson before going independent 20 years ago. And he also has consulted for the Martinelli family. Mm. And uh, we were buying grapes uh, from the Martinelli's and um, Lee senior, Lee Martinelli senior really likes our style of Chardonnay. He wanted to plant uh, a Chardonnay block for us. So Woolsey road is a three acre parcel it's uh, Woolsey Road parallels River Road to the south. So it's right to the south of where the Martinelli winery is. And um, it's a three-way collaboration. So Daniel did the soils work, chose the rootstock 420A, and the spacing, which is meter by two meters. So it's relatively close based. Mm-hmm. Then um, we provided the budwood, which was Old Wente, that we selected from the Hyde Vineyard and then put it at the Platt Vineyard, which Daniel designed for Lou Platt, um, mm-hmm. the longtime president of Hewlett Packard and briefly Kendall Jackson. And then we went and selected the Budwood um, from Platt and put it at Woolsey Road. So it's, it's like triple selected, uh, but non heat treated Wente, which is marked by, Really small clusters and and hen and chick, what the what the which the French call mineron d'age. So that's a run of larger berries with then some smaller berries, which are shot berries. Shot berries don't have seeds, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. in general the the yields are not going to be astronomical because the clusters are so small. And that, so that's a um, I would call it a textbook vineyard as opposed to, for example, Ritchie was originally planted in 1972. And mm-hmm. that's that's sort of a, a hodgepodge, um, but it's got some old vines, so that's good. And that um, that old Wente clone, what what is the the sort of the the, the significance of that? And, and and again, what is the what is the grape variety that we? Well, I mean, it, f- f- the morphology physically, it's such a small. I mean, it's about one third the size of a clone four cluster. Mm-hmm. Um, so you need. Not a day. You need you need closer spacing. You need more vines per acre if you're gonna gonna plant the wente. Now, what I like about it is it's it's um, it's not a, 
an overtly fruity um, character. It's it's more it's classic. I mean, it's 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 classic Chardonnay um, mm-hmm. without um, spicy or muscatty overtones um, or or a sort of juicy fruit character. Now we've talked about vineyard a bunch, Lawrence, but we haven't really talked about wine. I think your listeners should should understand, you know, basically the story back to kind of the story of Ramey Wine Cellars, what we are, is that um, I went to France and kind of watched how they made wine. And then I brought many, not all, but many of those techniques back to and applied them to really the tremendous fruit we have in California. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I remember um, I used to consult um, uh, for the Snowdens and Diana Snowden married Jeremy Sess of Dujac and they hosted a, a tasting with all the Dujac wines at our winery once and and Jeremy said you know you guys you guys that are sorting your grapes you're idiots I, I don't think he said that exactly you're <laughs> fools you're, um, you have perfect fruit you want to see rotten fruit? Come over, come over and look what we deal with in Burgundy. And and to a large degree, I think that's true. You know, it basically doesn't rain for eight months of the year. So mm-hmm. we don't have the same kind of, we have some, some mildew pressure from the fog, but we don't mm-hmm. face rain and hail and uh, the kind of natural disasters that can dog the, the traditional fringer vineyards in, 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 the, in Europe, really. Um, less so probably in Spain and Portugal and Italy, mm-hmm. but um, France certainly can have crappy weather. So anyway, so I, I took those techniques and, and used them here and, and it's evolved to, so we use native, native yeast. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't, we don't inoculate. We use native bacteria. A lot of times recently in the, in the heyday of high Parker scores, and spectator mm-hmm. scores for buttery, oaky, high alcohol, low acid Chardonnays. Mm-hmm. Uh, people, people, some people thought that oh, malolactic is a, is an insidious plot by activist California winemakers to make buttery Chardonnay, and that's not that's not true. Um, you can if you want to, but all wines go through malolactic naturally if you if you don't block it, if you don't add SO two sulfur dioxide to block it. All wines go through mallow on their own. Um, so we just let that happen. It's happening now. Most of our Chardonnays are are finished here, end of January, finished mallow, yeah. about to be sulfured. And um, there's only only one that, the, that's still going through, really, the Martinelli Charles Ranch. So so fully mallow, which, which gives you a complexity. Um, the aging on the lees integrates the diacetyl because the yeast, which are mostly still alive, have an enzyme, diacetyl reductase, which reduces diacetyl. That's where the batonage comes in. So is the bacteria are floating, spitting out diacetyl molecules once a week, or as the Burgundians say, tous les huit jours, uh, we, uh, we, we stir it up and then the yeast integrate, uh, metabolize the diacetyl. So mm-hmm. you get a soupçon of complexity without unidimensional butterscotch character. Um, so native yeast, native mallow, the Village Chardonnays, uh, the one we do for Berry's own, uh, our Russian River blend, and then our Sonoma Coast blend, they spend 12 months on the lees, um, mm-hmm. and then into tank um, and bottled in uh, in February. We'll start up week after next. Um, that's way Lafleve does it. Uh, the single vineyards, and there's five single vineyards, um, Hyde, Ritchie, Woolsey, Rocchioli and Westside Farms, they spend 20 months on the leaves, long time, the way it, mm-hmm. the way it used to be. So uh, Combe Le Fon still does that, Coast de Lee. Even, even in Burgundy, a lot of them don't, don't do that um, anymore. But the thing, long time in the leaves, it's, it's just the leaves are so important, um, subtle differences. An analogy I use is um, like if you make a bolognese, uh, you can get all your ingredients in and, and in one hour you, you, you can serve it if you want. But if you let it simmer for two or three more hours, you yeah. get a you get a superior flavor. Some things with wine, you just can't short circuit. It takes the time 
to let nature do its work. And and I don't claim to know everything that's going on, but yeah, so absolutely. Our, and then and then everything's unfiltered. We do not own mm-hmm. a filter. So um, so very old fashioned winemaking, even older fashioned than many in France are employing these days. I love it. And I think also, you know, what's super interesting for me, David, is, you know, you, you, you mentioning also, a, I guess, a, a moment in time when you, you brought in talking about, uh, you know, parkerization and, 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 and parker points. And, and, you know, I'm, you know, new to, to, to wine in, in many respects. And, and I think that, you know, the influences really of the, I guess, the marketing from around that time and the, and the communication and, and the style is is kind of you know still still burned into people's memories, and, I, and I'm just curious from from a sort of looking in the cellar and you know looking kind of you know behind the the curtain as it were, um, are, are there or you know or what have been really the, the kind of stylistic changes in terms of the winemaking that I, I guess you know maybe now the pressure isn't really so much there to to have to you know make wines to to kind of please that palate and to and to please that demand in, that's been created in the market what might be some of the changes that you know maybe to, to what you described there versus what you may have um, you know collectively done previously during that kind of parkerization era yeah i think um many california producers now that they're relieved of bob's uh, scores and uh, jim lobby's scores from the spectator mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, are, are are harvesting earlier, mm. so the alcohols. Many of the those those alcohols uh, of the high high scored wines, you know, fifteen sixteen percent, fifteen seven, um, and then uh, low acid, you know, higher pH, and then a lot of new oak. So if we harvest earlier, as I think I mentioned, we're 13.8, 13.9 alcohol, which mm-hmm. I've, I have no problem with that. Um, traditionally, if the Burgundians brought in it at 12.2, uh, they might chapitalize a point and a half, come up to 13.7. Certain amount of alcohol brings a pleasurable fullness and, and richness to the palate. Um, less new oak. Um, speaking for myself, when I started our business, the 60, the uh, Single vineyard Chardonnays were two thirds new, and the Village Chardonnays, the Russian River, mm-hmm. uh, one mm-hmm. third new. Mm-hmm. Now we're buying at ten percent new for the Village Chardonnays and fifteen mm-hmm. percent for the single vineyards. Sometimes comes in at twenty because the crop's low, but so less new oak and a um, little lower alcohol. Sometimes significantly lower, two points lower, and and. Um, a brighter acidity. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, Bob, Bob really didn't like acid. And uh, so a number of producers obliged him. But um, to me, there's a, uh, you know, there's, there's a, there's a certain freshness factor in white wine that I think is relevant. I love it. And really in closing, um, I'm, you know, intrigued and, uh, interested to see that you have, uh, as a family, you have plans to uh, travel to the UK uh, this coming April. Yep. Um, yep. And I also understand that you know we are in the UK. We're 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 quite thirsty um, for uh, your <laughs> top wines, and and yeah, I just wondered, you know, maybe you know, bring those two points together. Really, you know, the the the, the travels that you have planned, but then also. What a, what type of consumer is really kind of getting into your wines at the moment over in the UK? The one thing I would appeal to with your listeners is to, so many people, particularly, particularly in England, but also, say, in Asia, mm. are, are just burgundy junkies. I mean, that's mm. been the classic. And for me, it's a, it's a reference point. I consider our, I call our Chardonnays neo, neo-Burgundian or neoclassical, mm. but Many times, because of the quality of our fruit here in California and the, our care and techniques in the cellar, side by side, um, I think people f- often find our Chardonnay equal to or superior than many 
white burgundies. And that's what I would ask mm. um, is that you just, if you have a favorite white burgundy, open it sometime next to ours. And it doesn't have to be blind. It could be, it depends if you got, if you have, you know, half dozen people at the table, that could be fun to do that blind. But this is how I, and, and we all uh, back at Davis learned about wine is blind tasting, blind tasting. And I would just ask people to have an open mind and don't just think, oh, well, the Burgundy's better because taste them side by side, please. A huge thanks to today's guest, David Ramey of Ramey Wine Cellars. Visit RameyWine.com where you can learn more about their project and find their main social media handles. Please do help to amplify this episode and the series by sharing the direct link, which is interpretingwine.com slash 497. You can find links to all episodes from the series in the description below. And of course, I'd love to have you following along with me on social media, where I'm at Interpreting Wine on Instagram and Facebook, and at Wine Podcast on Twitter. Next time on the Interpreting Wine Sonoma County Winemaker Series in episode 498, I'll be speaking with Kim Stair-Wallace of Dry Creek Vineyard. Make sure you're subscribed to be alerted when the episode goes live. See you then.